uh, again, uh, Chief Operations here at the Registrar, and uh, this is the Applicant Education Seminar. We have uh, on the call from the Registrar as well, uh, Jesse Winter, uh, Public Information Liaison, and Maggie Roby, Assistant Chief of Licensing, and uh, uh, we will be using the chat function shot. Uh, Jesse will be posting relevant information uh, in there throughout the entire uh, presentation. Um, she is uh, she's very fortuitous as she will post something that um, may be uh, out, of, out of sync with the uh, slides, but it is in line with what we're talking about. So uh, if we're throwing information at you that uh, she thinks that you guys may want to look further into, she'll post a link or she'll uh, post uh, certain types of information there. Uh, so make sure you watch that. You're welcome to post any question you may have in there, uh, as well as uh, pause us and uh, you know un unmute yourself and uh, just ask the question as we're going through the material. Uh, this meeting is not for us. This meeting is for you. Um, you'll you'll have heard that throughout your lifetime. You know we're not doing this for us. We're doing this for you. Uh, but we really mean it. We're 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 here to answer your questions. We have a basic uh, PowerPoint that we're going to go through. To tell you every single requirement on our application but really if you have a question feel free uh stop us ask us and i do see that uh julie pickerel has joined uh so i'll, I'll get her name uh set up for you but she is our chief of licensing uh, uh, we'll be applying to whatever you do apply for your license all right so to get started um went through introduction. So house rules, again, unless you have a question, please do mute yourself. Uh, this is being recorded. Uh, so keep that in mind. So use the chat function if you do have a question. Um, and otherwise, just a reminder, the, the meeting will be recorded. We will send an email out to you after the meeting is over. And that email will include a couple different things. Uh, and it, one of the things is going to be a link to YouTube for uh, being able to rewatch this exact meeting um, so that you can go back. Not everyone's uh, uh, going to be applying for the license within the next week. Some people are attending this, kind of building up to what they what they plan to do within three to six months. We understand that. That's why we're recording the video so you can, in whatever your time frame is, come back and watch the video and refresh yourself. Um, also, the the contact information is in there. Uh, you should feel free to reach out to us at any time throughout your uh, application process. <clears throat> All right. Um, what we hope that you get out of this meeting is that, number one, you feel comfortable using our website. Uh, we have a portal that is used uh, for any type of licensing need. You can file your new application. You can file your renewal in two years after the, the license is issued. Uh, you can change addresses, emails, phone, anything. Uh, can be accomplished through our website. So well, number one, we want you to be comfortable using it. Um, number two, we are going to pound away today that there are uh, certain deficiencies that we know exist in common with a lot of applications. Um, we're going to educate you as to what those uh, deficiencies are and uh, uh, how you can best avoid uh, running into those issues. Uh, and finally, of course, again, questions. We're here to answer them. Miss Maggie. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so today we are going to talk a lot about deficiencies. Um, so what are some of the top errors or deficiencies that we are finding in applications? Um, so we can see the top five common errors here. The first one being the qualifying party's experience. So that could be anything along the lines of, um, you know, not submitting enough detailed experience um, or a description of the work that was either done or supervised being done. Um, that could also entail, you know, not specifying whether you covered uh, residential or commercial work or both. Um, the next would be bonds. Um, so that would be most most of the time that's going to be errors with your bond form. So whether it is missing a signature, you know, the, the amounts are not correct, um, or the name on the bond. Um, also your ID. So anybody who is going to be named on the application needs to submit to us a valid and legible government issued ID. Um, testing. 
So you will need to submit your statutes and rules exam and your trade exam. So a lot of times we see either testing is not submitted um, or a waiver is not submitted. And we'll kind of discuss more about a waiver a little bit later. And then the final thing would be background checks. So background checks need to be completed within 90 days from when we received your application. So that is also one of those common errors that we are seeing. Yeah. So just to really quickly run back through them, uh, the experience, often it's just not detailed enough. And if you're applying for a dual license, we do need you to detail experience in residential and commercial work. Um, the bond, it is <clears throat> it is a legal document. Uh, and because it is a legal document, it has to be exactly correct. Um, that That's uh, kind of a non-negotiable as it goes whenever it goes to reviewing uh, the bond. So we are going to go point by point in this presentation on exactly how to fill that bond uh, form out. IDs and background checks usually relate to it being expired or just simply not a, not submitting it. And testing, as uh, Maggie said, it's either um, not submitted or uh, a waiver for uh, the test is not submitted. So we'll get into them. Just wanted to recap them real quick. And throughout the entire presentation, what we'll be doing is pointing out whether one of these top five, so that it's kind of an eye catcher for you of as we're getting ready to go over the information, we'll be pointing to it with this logo. Maggie. Yeah, so how can you submit your license application? So there are a couple of different ways for you to submit your application. Um, we strongly recommend that you use our online portal. Um, so you can pretty much submit your application and then update anything on once you have your license through the portal. Um, this is really where we try to point contractors to because, because it is the most efficient and fastest way for you to get your application to us. Um, there is also the option to mail it to um, the PO box listed on our website. And you can bring it in person if you if you would prefer to do it that way. Um, because of COVID, we do require that you do call in and you know schedule an appointment and confirm with us that your application is complete before you actually bring it in. But again, we do highly suggest that you use that online portal to submit your app. Thank you. And Julie, we do have a question coming in, or Maggie, either one. Um, mm -hmm. The question is from Carly. If my experience is over 15 years in commercial construction, I'm hoping to apply for a residential license. Is that going to be a problem? No, I can answer that for you. So no, that should not be a problem. You just need to make sure um, that two of those years is when, within the last 10 years. Um, as long as you have that commercial experience, um, that will sometimes su supersede the residential experience. Um, but that experience there should be good to go. Great. All right. So the portal, first thing you'll want to do is create an account. Um, and the Maggie will go over the type of information that's required to uh, create that account. Yeah. So we're going to need a couple, well, quite a few things <laughs> to create your portal account. So we will need your authorized representative's information. So the authorized representative is going to be the person that has the authority to sign on behalf of the entity that is applying for the license. Um, so we would need their name, date of birth, email address, their you know preferred method of contact, and then they will choose when they're setting up their account some security questions to answer, um, and that is for you know down the road if you needed to reset the password. And then also we will need the business entity's information. So the type of entity it is, is it an LLC? Is it a corporation, a partnership? You know, what is the entity? Um, what is that entity? And then also the corporation commission file number. So this is only if it's going to be an LLC or a corporation, you would need to register and provide us with the Arizona Corpor Corporation Commission number. Um, we will also need a valid email address, a physical business address, and a phone number for the entity. Great. Uh, um, so this is a good opportunity to really kind of break and educate you a little bit about what our licenses are. 
Uh, in the state of Arizona, we actually license a business entity rather than individuals. Um, I'm from Ohio, where often a, uh, a contractor is licensed on the individual level. I believe it's also done in um, Texas, where individuals are licensed to do uh, perform work. Uh, in the state of Arizona, however, it is actually um, that we will license a business, and then any W-2 or legitimate employee of that business will be able to work under that license. Um, so whenever Maggie's talking about types of entities, what you're required to do is first uh, determine whether you're going to be a sole proprietorship, an LLC, a corporation, whatever, whatever business entity you want to operate, that's what you'll need to do first and then apply for a uh, construction or con it, it's really a construction company license uh, to be able to perform the work. And so when we're going through these requirements, try to keep that in mind and we'll recap after um, after this is over to kind of talk about what, what the requirements are and why they relate to who we require you to name on a license. So we'll, we'll keep going, but just wanted to introduce that idea for you. So this is how you're going to access the online portal. So if you visit our registrar's homepage and you click on my account, um, we're going to watch a couple of demonstration videos on how to create an account and how to link your business to an account using the online portal. Great. And let me know if you can hear it. In this video, you'll learn how to create an account for the ROC online customer portal. To create an account, visit www.roc.az.gov and click the My Account menu option. In the drop-down box next to the question, Do you have an account already? Select the No, I need to register option and fill in your information below. personal information you enter should be your full legal name and date of birth as it appears on your government-issued ID. When choosing security questions and answers, make sure to choose something that will be easy for you to remember. Obviously, this is a demonstration, but when you're doing it, please do fill out the government ID, the preferred email, or preferred contact communication information, uh, and do include your phone numbers because if there's anything wrong with your application, guess what we're using to try to contact you? That information. So we do need it, um, and uh, please do provide it. In this video, you will learn how to connect an existing license and business to your ROC online and I won't customer restart portal it again, account. I swear. Once logged in, you can add the business entity to that account by going to the Licenses and Accounts button from the dashboard. On the Licenses and Accounts page, follow the steps and add the business entity. When searching for your business entity, do not add any punctuation and less is more. You only need to type a couple of words to find your business name. As you can see from this example, the business name I'm searching for is ZZZ John ROC Test Account. But I only need to search for ZZZ John to find my business. After selecting your business and hitting the continue button, a licensing representative will review your request and approve or deny the connection to the business entity. They may attempt to contact your business to confirm the connection with an authorized representative of the company. If the licensing department denies the connection, it is likely because they couldn't contact your business or were otherwise unable to confirm the connection. You can contact the licensing rep to ask for more information by emailing licensing. Okay, so uh, Rick, I saw your question. Should Who should be filling out that uh, first portion? Um, <clears throat> it's gonna be whoever uh, the author, it, it can be really anybody. Um, anybody that uh, you're going to enable to make changes to your license, though. Um, 
that can be an authorized representative. It can be, as you said, the agent or an attorney for the license. It can be if you're using a school, uh, it can be one of the schools uh, that is creating the account for you. Um, as you saw in the second video, um, if it is in additional in individuals who are wanting to be added to an account to make changes to a license, that is something that's going to have to be reviewed by the licensing department whenever you get there. It makes perfect sense. Uh, I should not be able to simply say that I am connected to a uh, licensee and be able to make changes. Uh, licensing department will review that request and make contact with the authorized or the uh, owner of the company to make sure that that individual is allowed to make changes. Um, and I apologize, I skipped the first half of, or the second half of that first video. So I am going to go back um, and how to create, and hopefully I'll be able to skip ahead. Hello. Okay, so this is where she was saying if you don't have an account, then you'll need to enter the information. I you reminded enter, you to please fill out the communication and information, and, and that's where as we it kind appears of left on off. your government issued ID. When choosing security questions and answers, make sure to choose something that will be easy for you to remember. After clicking the Register for the Customer Portal button, you will need to confirm your email account before you can log in. To confirm your email account, check your email and look for an email from Arizona Register of Contractors. If you do not see the email in your inbox, please check your spam folder. In the email, please click the link to confirm your email and finish registering for your account. Okay, so it's just like... The link will return you to the ROC website. Just like most other accounts that you're setting up online, uh, the only difference is, is if you're gonna be adding additional information or additional individuals again. So on that second one where you're adding somebody to the account, uh, it can take a little bit of time this to video. Uh, get that accomplished because licensing does have to review it. And as Jesse said, since I butchered the showing of the videos, she will be including them with the email that goes out to you. <laughs> All right, back to you, Maggie. Okay. All right. So now that you've created your account, um, you're going to complete your application, right? So Again, like Jim mentioned, um, we license the entities. Um, so we issue licenses to the business entities, not the individuals. Um, so that is going to be either a sole proprietorship, partnerships, an LLC, corporation, or a trust. Um, so you will need to identify on the application um, the name of the entity list, um, needs to, and the name of the entity also needs to match. Um, so that means um, sole proprietorships and partnerships have to list the name of the sole proprietor or the partners as it appears on your government issued ID. Um, the LLCs and the corporations, the name needs to match exactly as it is filed with the Arizona Corporation. Um, and the trust needs to match exactly as it appears on the trust certificate. Um, so one thing to know also when you do um, register with the Arizona Corporation Commission, we will check the status. So your status needs to be listed as active and in good standing. So DBAs. So DBA stands for doing business as. Um, so the, you may you can contract under a DBA if it is approved by the ROC. So meaning it is listed on the application and on your bond form when you submit the bond form. Um, so we do suggest that you and recommend that you register it with the Arizona Secretary of State as well. Um, DBAs can be changed, add, added, removed at any time. Um, DBAs cannot include LLC or Inc. So you would have to remove that LLC or ink at the end of the DBA. And also, <clears throat> your DBA name has to, if it's going to suggest the type of work you do, that type of work must be in your scope. So if I am um, Maggie LLC and I want a DBA that says um, Maggie's Plumbing, 
I better have a plumbing license or that DBA is not going to be approved. Um, you know, it just makes common sense to, to you hearing it, but we're, we're simply, we're not in the naming business, but we're not going to approve a DBA that suggests work outside the scope of your permit or the license. So, all right. So once you've determined like your entity name, um, what you're applying as, you'll then need to just determine which classification you're going to apply for. Um, so we do have over 155 different classifications and those different license classifications cover a variety of scopes. So we do have um, a list of all of our license classifications and the scope of work that they cover on our website. Um, it is going to be divided based on residential, commercial, and then if you are, are going to apply for a dual license, which would be both. Um, it's really, really important to know which classification you're going to apply for because that will determine your bond amounts and your testing and your fees and pretty much everything. Um, if you are unsure of what license classification you want to apply for or which lic license classification your scope of work falls under, you can submit what is called a scope determination request form. And what that does is that provides us with some information just on the scope of work you're going to be doing. And then as the assistant chiefs and chief of licensing, we review that and we send you a letter by email and mail. And we also contact you to let you know the determination of that request. Yeah, 155 may sound daunting whenever you think about it, but it's actually really about 50 uh, license classifications, but there's 50 in commercial, uh, basically identical, 50 in residential, and then obviously a 50 identical in dual. So really you're looking through a list of about 50 classifications to to determine what uh, what the scope aligns with the work that you want to do. We do also have a license classifications requirement form, and that gives you kind of a detail as far as like your experience that's needed, the exams that's needed, and information based off that classification. So your qualifying party. So your qualifying party will need is going to be required to provide the following information to us in the application. So every qualifying party must take and pass the Arizona Statutes and Rules exam. Um, your test is good for two years from the day that you tested. Um, there is no way to waive this if you're not on a prior Arizona license or you are from out of state, you cannot waive this exam. Um, if you were listed, if your qualifying party was listed on an active Arizona license within the last five years, they do not have to retake the statutes and rules exam, but a new qualifying party absolutely has to take and pass it. Um, each qualifying party also has to take and pass the trade exam, and that is specific to the trade that you are applying for. They also need to provide extensive um, history of experience. That is going to include the dates of employment, um, hours that were worked, the position they held, um, and a detailed description of the work that was done or the work that was supervised being done. So. Like we said before, this is one of our common deficiencies. Um, so I suggest reading your license classification and the scope of your license classification and then making sure that your experience falls under that scope correctly, um, you know, and be detailed. So if you are applying for a commercial license, you know, you need to give us the commercial experience. Um, also, your name as it's listed on your ID, the date of birth, social security number, driver's license or government ID, residential address, phone number, email, title, percent of ownership, if any, and a background check. Yeah, and the only thing I can add with uh, experience, um, so Chris is asking W-2s to prove experience. Let's see if... If I can give you a little bit more information, it's much more of a narrative um, 
narrative that you're providing in the experience portion of the uh, application. Uh, if you're applying for a specialty license, talk about the actual equipment that uh, you're installing on on what type of structures, you know, if it's HVAC, what type of products are you actually installing? Um, uh, you can say how often, you can say uh, what the larger capacities, what your normal um, install, install looks like. If you're doing, if you're applying for a general contractor's license, uh, talk about, you know, talk about the um, work from the ground up, talk about the trades that you're supervising. Um, and the types of uh, again structures that you're you're erecting, um, it is a narrative. Um, so the W two probably would not suffice because um, that's just telling where you worked. It wouldn't say whether what type of work you are performing for that company. Um, but but you're you're welcome to say what type of work that you did for that company. The only other thing I'll I'll point out is if you do look at that license, um, the license. Uh, classification requirements page it's it's going to show you that in some cases there's interplay between if you have experience you may not be required to take the trade exam or if you take the trade exam you might be able to um, then pass the trade exam <clears throat> then uh, you may have reduced years of experience required to show um, so electrical yeah Chris you're just going to want to talk about uh, the type of electrical um, that you've performed, that you've installed in different, was it commercial, was it residential? Um, I, I'm not from the construction industry, so I, I can't give you exact examples as to uh, what licensing will look for, um, but, but you're gonna wanna talk about the type of uh, installations you've done in the electrical world. And if you need more examples, I would point you to what? Becky. <clears throat> yeah, and one thing I will mention too, um, Please make sure in your experience, it again should cover hands-on experience or managerial experience supervising that trade being done. Um, a lot of times we get contractors who say like, oh, well, I held a pre-con meeting. Okay, but that's not like supervising the actual trade being done. So please just make sure that is it is that hands-on or managerial experience of the specific scope. Yeah. And uh, Galaxy S9 asked, <clears throat> how many years of experience? I would point you to that, uh, the classifications requirements form. Uh, it's going to outline every single classification that we have. Uh, and again, this is a top five because experience is one of the issues that we have. So if you do have um, more questions, I either put them out here and I, I'll have Maggie or Julie respond. Um, but uh, yeah, let, let's get your questions answered. And Chris, if I, if I was not specific enough, feel free to speak up. Um, all right, so the other ones, uh, the exams, the driver's license and the background checks, all top five issues. Um, I can tell you what's not on here being the top five, bonds is, uh, it represents 30% of the applications that we receive have a bond issue. So when we go over that, just make sure you're, you're really paying attention on that one. <clears throat> Margaret, Mar have about residency? Okay, thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, Margaret, there is no um, residency requirement with uh, a qualifying party. Um, again, whenever we, we issue licenses to businesses, so if you are a out-of-state business op looking to operate inside the state of Arizona, uh, the only thing you would need to do is approach uh, Arizona Corporation Commission and file proper paperwork for, Jesse just posted it for you, <clears throat> for, like I said, she is on top of it, um, <laughs> for uh, granting authority to foreign corporations to transact business in the state. So we do not have a uh, requirement for qualifying parties to live in the state, but what I will tell you in turn is that, that that qualifying party is responsible for the work being done inside of Arizona, and they are supposed to be a, uh, a, a managing employee of the work that's being performed, and we hold them accountable for it. So I, I, I answer with the, the truth that they do not need to be, but uh, with a warning of they should be probably involved intimately with the projects that are happening here. Um, <clears throat> I got a private uh, a question. Is there reciprocity with uh, Washington for a general contractor's license? So we're about to go over the waivers, uh, so I appreciate your your question. Um, 
we don't have reciprocity with uh, any state um, except for California, which was signed back in the 80s or so. We still do recognize that reciprocity, um, but it, I can tell you it's much easier for us to uh, perform waivers uh, than it is for us to meet other states' licensing requirements. Um, so we, we work with waivers mainly, and that's what uh, Maggie's going to go over with you. Yeah. So there is an option. Did they what? Did you see where to go into for the qualifying? <laughs> go for it, Maggie. Okay. So there are two waivers that a qualifying party can submit. The first one is the in-state waiver. So that is for a qualifying party can waive their statutes and rules exam if they were named on an Arizona license within the past five years. Um, for the in-state applicants, the trade exam can be waived also if the qualifying party was named on, the Arizona, on an Arizona license of the same classification within the past five years. So it has to be, if it's an in-state applicant and you're waiving from an in-state license, it has to be the same classification. For out-of-state applicants, for those of you who maybe have a license in another state and you want to be licensed in Arizona, um, for the qualifying party, the statutes and rules exam cannot be waived. That is specific to Arizona statutes and rules. So there is no way that you could take that exam in another state. Um, the trade exam is um, can possibly waive your be waived if the qualifying party was named on a comparable license within the last five years. And then we also need to receive verification. Um, on that waiver from the uh, from the licensing board or licensing agency from the other state. Um, so it, there is a portion, the top portion, the applicant fills out, and then the bottom portion you can be sent to your state agency or your licensing agency, and they complete that bottom to verify your out-of-state uh, license. Yeah, so just to really quickly recap, the statute and rules exam, <coughs> can be waived for uh, five years. Actually, I think we passed, we changed it to forever. Um, if you've been previously licensed in the state of Arizona and it, statute and rules cannot be waived, obviously, if you've uh, been licensed in another state looking for it to be waived, because again, we do have different rules and statutes. Um, trade exams, basically what we're talking about is two code periods. So within five years, if you've held a license in, in the same comparable, uh, we, may be able to waive that for you. Um, so that's that's what we're looking at. We do have two questions. Uh, one, my experience is managerial. So Maggie, for you, I'm applying for a residential general contractor's license. Is it necessary for me to have field experience? So if your experience is managerial, you need to at least be in the field watching the work being done. Like you need to be, there needs to be supervision of the work being done. You don't have to actually be like conducting the work yourself, but you would have to be supervising that work being done. Okay. <clears throat> um, and can a non-U.S. citizen be a qualified qualifying party? Um, so to be listed on a license as a qualifying party or an employee, you would have to have authorized uh presence in the United States. Uh, so to to actually have the have a job in general, you would have to have authorized presence. And yes, we do require that you have authorized presence in the United States or be a citizen to, to be a qualifying party. And then if I'm an owner, operator, employee, what do I need to fill out in section three, men, member or manager? So that's going to be based. So that is going to be based on how you uh, establish your entity with the Arizona Corporation Commission. So if you register with them as a member managed <laughs> entity LLC. or a manager managed LLC, um, that's how you would determine between member or manager. And so, if he, I guess his question it is, is he is filling out an LLC. Um, <clears throat> Does he need to fill out the section three? You or she, I guess. Oh, it's just me. Um, so you would you would provide your just your information. Um, 
and you would have, I'm assuming, 100% ownership. Um, and then that that would be all you would need. You wouldn't put anybody else on there. Um, but then you would you would determine that member or manager based on how you register with the corporation commission. So if I'm hearing you right, I, I would still need to fill out the section three, but it would be a lot of repeated information. Correct. Okay. So Chris, apologies. I don't think it's the answer you want, but fill out the part three uh, and you would be the manager. Okay. Okay. So exam information <coughs> reference materials. Yeah. So the registrar, so we do all of our testing through PSI. PSI conducts, conducts all of the statutes and rules and trade exams. So there is a information bulletin and this information bulletin includes a list of the reference materials um, for the statutes and rules exam and also includes a link for kind of like some content outline and reference materials for each specific trade exam as well. So this bulletin is on our, uh, our website um, under testing information. Um, there is also on our website contact information for PSI. Um, you can contact them by phone. You can also register for testing online. Um, my suggestion for testing is um, to schedule your exam separately. Um, that way um, you can get a sooner, a quicker testing date. What do you mean by that, Maggie? Oh, so if you have to take both of your exams, um, what we have found is sometimes when contractors are trying to register with PSI, um, it only looks for like that block of time, which is like, you know, a, a large amount of time. So if you register like your SRE and your trade exams separately, they give you more availability because it's a smaller amount of time. I gotcha. So, so if we were to think about it, the statute and rules test may take two hours or three hours. The trade exam takes another three hours. So if you're looking to book it at the same time, PSI is going to look for the six hour block. Whereas if you register differently, then you could do one Saturday, one test and another Saturday, another test. Got it. Cool. Thank you, madam. Yeah. We do get a lot of questions about exams. The best and I think it's just because people are weary or hesitant about, you know, am I going to pass the exam? Um, what we can tell you is uh, we don't recommend any schools, just to skip to that question and answer. Um, we, we're a government entity, so we can't uh, recommend a private uh, entity to you, which one's better, whether, it, whether you need one or not. Um, we hope you don't need one. Um, the reference material, all exams, trade exams, and the statute and rules are open book. Um, of course, if you've ever taken an open book, that's both a saving grace and a curse because it just you you spend a lot of time trying to find answers if you don't know the answers. Um, and then uh, the other question we get is where can we find um, the content or where you're getting the questions from, and that's what this slide is showing. If you click on one of those links, it's going to tell you the references, the exact references that, that uh, every question comes from. Um, I can tell you, uh, Jesse and I just went through the statute and rules book and um, found some questions from uh, previous years that uh, don't don't apply to uh, any reference material that you should have to buy. So we, we strip those from the exam. It's a it's a pretty pretty arduous and fun task, but uh, you know we want to make this as straightforward as possible for you guys whenever you're taking the exams. Uh, can exams be done online or do they have to be in person? Uh, we actually just uh, this week moved forward with uh, PSI to move all of our exams online. That's going to take uh, a couple of months for them to accomplish. Um, but uh, we are moving them on online. So it, I, my answer to you depends on when you actually want to take that exam. Uh, their, their deadline for me is September 30th, I believe. Um, so if you're looking to take the exam after September 30th, it'll be online. If it's before then, it'll be uh, brick and mortar uh, center offered by PSI. 
Okay. All right. So who else is going to be required to be named on your application? So if you are applying as an LLC, um, you will need to provide the names and information of owners of 20% or more. Um, that includes all members if it is a member-managed LLC and all managers if it is a manager-managed LLC. Um, if you are applying as a corporation, you would need to provide the information for presidents, vice president, secretary, treasurer, or functional equivalent of these officers, as well as any owners of at least 25% um, and the directors. So Chris, here was your answer. Um, so and if an LLC, you must be listed regardless of uh, whether you're the only one. Uh, where is PSI located? PSI, as Julie said, has locations throughout Arizona. Actually, they're, they're international, um, so they have uh, locations worldwide, but uh, here in Arizona, they have several in the Valley, I believe one in Flag and one in Tucson. Uh, so you would just want to go to their website and uh, you can search for the locations there. <clears throat> All right, mainly LLC or corporations. The exam does, Margaret, the exam does not have to be taken in the state, but uh, you would have to find a PSI location out of state to uh, be able to take the PSI exam that is administered for the ROC. So next we're going to talk about tiered entities. So a tiered entity is an entity that is owned or operated by another entity. So you can see our example of our tiered entity here. We have the red corporation, which is owned or operated by the blue LLC. So then therefore the red corporation would now be, con would be considered a tiered entity. So if you are applying as a tiered entity, you are going to be required to submit an organizational chart, which should look somewhat similar to the one that we have up. Um, it does need to include the following items. So it needs to have the names and addresses of all owners of 25% or more. Um, it needs to, for any individual that owns 25% or more, um, they need to identify those individuals by name and address. Um, it needs to be signed by an authorized representative. And it needs to also include the attestation that no person or entity other than those listed owns 25% or more of the applicant. So we do also need you to list the ownership percentages um, for each owning entity and individual. So this form and instructions is also found on our website as well. Um, and it has all of the information that you need to provide to us. And the thing I'll point out here is in the form that she posted to the uh, chat, you'll see down in the bottom right-hand corner, no person or entity other than those listed owns 25% or more than the applicant, uh, and then in line for a signature. That's what, uh, that's what Maggie means by the attestation it doesn't have the signature. You just have to sign that bottom right-hand corner saying uh, everything in the chart is accurate and uh, to your knowledge as full as possible as to who owns the entity that you're planning to get licensed. <clears throat> yeah, so what are the requirements for a person who is going to be named on the application? So we do need you to provide us with the name as it is listed on their ID, date of birth, social security, driver's license, um, their residential or business address, phone number, email address, their title, percentage of ownership, and background check. So this is another one of those slides that has a lot of those common deficiencies in it. Um, background checks have to be completed through um, First Advantage, which the link for that can be found on our website as well. Um, and they need to be within 90 days of when we receive your application. Um, so please make sure to include that as well as also, driver's license or government ID, it needs to be valid, meaning not expired, and it also needs to be legible, so we need to be able to read it. 
Um, sometimes we find that because it's being scanned or it's a copy, it might be a little darker or illegible. So just make sure it's legible and we can read it. And a question about the exam being open book, where, what, what materials uh, do I suggest that you take and where can you get them? Um, the materials that you are allowed to take are limited to those that are in that bulletin. Um, the testing location will not allow you to bring um, additional additional or different materials into the test center. Uh, where you can obtain them, um, you would either need to uh, find them, uh, I, I, I think online, buy them. Um, there are uh, there are certain the ones that you can download, like the uh, stat statute and rules annotated book, that's on our website. Uh, but if it's uh, code related, um, those we don't provide. Uh, so if you want to take it in as an open book, then you would need to source that yourself. Uh, I did see another question coming in. Uh, would an out of state ID work? Yes, of course. Uh, an out of state ID is accepted. It's just make sure the biggest problem with IDs, again, is number one, they're not submitted, or number two, they're they're expired. Uh, in Arizona, that's less of an issue since you know we our, our old licenses last 50 years. Um, but uh, the, in other states coming in, then uh, they expire within usually four years or so. Um, can a partnership license be used out of state such as Texas? Um, I'm not sure what a partnership license is, uh, but a license out of state uh, would not be able to use be used in state. So if you are a general contractor licensed in the state of Texas, that license would not be able to be used in the state of Arizona, but it could be used to help with waivers uh, when you're applying for the license in Arizona. So if that doesn't answer your question, we'll have to try again. All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna go through it real quick um, to talk about what we've talked about. Uh, as I said, we issue licenses to business entities. Uh, and then we require certain information from you uh, to be able to qualify that license for that business. Um, so every business is going to require a qualifying party. That's the individual who has the knowledge and experience to be able to perform the work. That makes sense to a lot of people. Uh, the other information we're going to require um, is, uh, is anybody that can actually make a business decision. Um, so anybody with over 25% uh, ownership, anybody named as a, uh, a principal on a business entity with the Arizona Corporation Commission. So that you're starting to get the idea. It's anybody who can actually perform the work and then anybody who can actually direct the work. So the business drivers and the individual performing the work, that's who we need information on. Um, and all of it's detailed in uh, ARS 32.11.22 as to what, in, what information we need, but uh, this, this just kind of recaps for you. Any individual following under those categories, we're going to need that in additional information for. So everybody that uh, qualifies as being named on a license, we need the background check. We need the government ID. We, um, we obviously don't need testing for everybody. We need testing for the qualifying party and experience for the qualifying party. Um, but uh, I, I, I wanted to just take a moment to kind of reflect on what we've told you so far and why. Um, so that's, that's the reasoning behind uh, the collection of information is, number one, it's statutory, but uh, to, to, to define what the statutory scheme is for Arizona is that it's we license a business. All right, so additional disclosures on those individuals named on the business, or named on license. Yes, so when you submit your application, you will be required to complete the disclosures page. So Arizona law does require that every person named on a license have good character and reputation. So for that reason, we ask you to disclose if you had any prior license, any prior license information, like any licenses that were revoked or currently suspended any unlicensed activities, meaning any citations or convictions, and any cr criminal history. So any felony convictions or pending charges. So for that reason, every person on the application must disclose that information to us 
if you do answer yes to any of those questions, then you may be required to submit additional documentation. Um, so we would look into, you know, if you marked yes, that you have prior felonies, we would do a felony review and review the criminal history. If you had unlicensed citations or convictions, we would go through to make sure that um, any like payment that was needed to remedy that was taken care of. Um, and also, you know, if there's any revocations or current suspensions, um, you would want to submit documents showing that the cause of the suspension or the revocation was resolved. Yeah, and so I don't want <clears throat> I don't want anybody to be fearful. If you've had a felony or have a criminal history, uh, it is not a bar to licensure uh, with the registrar contractors. In fact, eighty eight percent of applications with a felon applicant on the license. Uh, actually get the license issued. Um, as you can imagine, um, good character and reputable behavior is a very broad um, language, but it is actually statutorily uh, limited to the criminal history, anything a felony, unlicensed activity, and we interpret that as causing damage to somebody. Uh, prior license in information, again, if it's going to be an issue for you, it's causing damage to somebody or having a reason for why your license, uh, prior license was suspended or revoked. Um, so we are narrowly looking at those things. Um, and felonies, we, a lot of the times, were not statutorily allowed, nor would we want to consider some of the felonies. Um, uh, so I can tell you, they, they typically have to be related to the industry that you're trying to obtain licensure for. So if you had a DUI from 20 years ago, that's not exactly tied to the industry that you're looking to be licensed for. Uh, if you fraudulently stole money from somebody in Sun City uh, to perform uh, a contracting, that's pretty closely related to your industry, and we're going to probably look into that a lot more than the DUI. Um, but again, just know that it's not a straight bar from you obtaining licensure and 88% on it. Since we started the Good Character Committee, it, it's been a solid 88% received licensure if you're, if you're a felon. Just work with us, get us the following information that Maggie's going to tell you about. Yeah, so the reason we really touch on this is because a lot of times the felony review may not be a reason that your license is going to be denied, but it can delay the process of your application being approved. So there are some documents that we are going to ask for if you do indicate that you had a felony um, to review your criminal history. So that would be like indictment or, or, or the complaint, the court's findings or a plea agreement. Um, documentation of the sentence, completion of your sentence, um, satisfaction of the restitution, if that's applicable, um, an order restoring your civil rights, um, and then other optional documents that you can support, as, that you can submit as well, could be things like, um, you know, just a letter that kind of explains what happened and, you know, where, where you are now, um, letters of reference, um, any kind of treatment or recovery program that's relevant to it that has been completed um, or any other like educational, personal or professional achievements that you received after the conviction. And then prior to submitting your application, if you are fearful that, you know, maybe your felony conviction is going to automatically deny you from getting a license, you can petition for us to review your felony history prior to applying. Um, that can be done by um, downloading the petition for review of criminal record form, um, and that gets submitted to us. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Maggie. Um, we're going to skip on to bonds because I really want to cover this. I know we only have about five minutes of scheduled time left. We will continue the presentation until we're done and we will send that recording out to you. Um, but uh, I, I want to get to bonds before we end, uh, hit the end time that we told you. Again, we will continue on and we will finish the presentation, but uh, go ahead, Maggie. Okay, so some of the errors, so there are a couple of types of bonds. So we have a surety bond, a cash bond, and then the assigned certificate of deposit. 
So the most common type of bond that we see is going to be the surety bond. Um, we do have a list of um, bond companies in the state of Arizona on our website um, that you know are pretty familiar with uh, providing bonds for our contractors. Um, so what a bond is, is I always say it's kind of like insurance. Um, it's your insurance policy. So you don't have to put the entire amount up. You pay like your premium payment um, and they provide you with the bond coverage. Um, with a cash bond, you would have you would submit the full amount by either cash, money order, or cashier's check to us. And then the certificate of deposit, you can purchase um, a continuously or automatically renewable CD from a federal Arizona bank. Um, and then you would contact us <clears throat> um, to request the agreement form for that. So it's really important to go over bonds because, again, bonds are one of our most common errors. Um, so some of the errors that we see in bonds are going to be um, things like not signing the bond or your, uh, your penal sums, your amounts on your bond are not specified. So if you are you know, applying for a dual license, you need to have your penal sum split according to residential and commercial. Um, so a couple of things to go over on the bond form. The name of the entity that is on the bond form needs to match the application. So that also needs to include a DBA. If you applied and your application includes a DBA, then please include the DBA on your bond form. Um, also, it needs to include the license classification and the description of the classification, and that needs to match exactly as well. Also, your coverage amounts, your penal sums um, need to be separated, like I said, according to residential and commercial. Um, the effective date on your bond, um, it needs to be within six months of when we receive your application. So if it is older than six months, then we will request a full force letter from the bond company. Um, if it is a future date on the bond, then um, your application cannot be approved until we reach that date. So your reviewer will probably contact you and ask you if you can get a more current up-to-date bond. Otherwise, your application cannot go further. Um, and then the last thing, your bond needs to be signed by an authorized person. Um, if your qualifying party is only listed as the qualifying party on your entity, then they are not going to be able to sign your bond form. They need to have a, another title, whether that is, you know, member or, um, you know, authorized representative, um, but it needs to be an authorized signer on that bond form. And then the last thing, it needs to have the bond seal and it needs to be notarized. Yeah, so how do you know how much bond coverage you need? Um, so what you're going to do is when you go to our bond information page, which can also be found on our website, um, you're going to use the chart to pretty much determine you know, the type of classification that you're going to apply for and then the estimated annual volume that you are expecting. So when you have those two things, you can look at the bond amount that is going to be required. Um, if you have a dual, you would need to have um, each. So you would need to look at the commercial and the residential and you would need to have both of those bond amounts listed on the bond form as well. And again, they'd be listed as <clears throat> as the example shows. So forty two fifty for residential, and then twenty five hundred uh, for commercial for this example of carpentry. Um, so you could uh, the this uh, breakdown is again on our website, and you would just want to fill those uh, those penal sums out separately, but make sure it uh, adds up to the total required. Okay. So going through, uh, if we were to consider carpentry, uh, how we got the numbers that we showed in the example bond form, uh, carpentry is residential specialty contracting. 
And if I were expecting to do less than uh, $375,000 in gross volume per year, uh, then my my total bond amount requirement would be forty two fifty, and we have to go since it's a dual license CR seven commercial residential seven uh, carpentry. I also have to consider the commercial, and again it's specialty for less than one hundred and fifty thousand, so twenty five hundred, and there's where you get your uh, your amounts. Uh, if you're general contracting, then obviously you use the uh, the general contracting schedules, uh, and if anything else, then you use the specialty. Okay. Um, I know we've hit time, uh, but again, we'll keep going. We've got about five more slides. Uh, workers' compensation is obviously next, uh, and then we'll talk about application fees, but if you cannot stay, um, Worry not, we'll send you the link to the video covering the rest of this. Um, but we will uh, keep going and we'll, we'll round out the rest of this presentation and answer any questions you may have at the end. Yeah. Okay, so workers' compensation. So oh, you Maggie, are actually, going. Real quick. Yeah. Um, Sergeant, you asked about the uh, time frame to issue a license after we receive it. Um, so basically, what we're looking at is uh, less than around five days if everything is correct in the application. Uh, after you submit the application, it'll be issued as a license. Uh, if there are issues, then we're looking at about an average of 20 days to issue the license. Um, that's just working with you to get the information that's uh, required. And uh, that 20 days is, uh, as you can imagine, that's an average. So there's some, some that are far beyond the 20 days and some that are far less than the 20 days. Uh, but again, it really depends on if it's a background check and you, you filed it today. Uh, say it was a deficiency that we found on your application and we notified you that a background check uh, had not been submitted on an individual. It takes the background check company about twenty or two weeks rather uh, to turn a background check. So no matter what, that deficiency is going to cause a two-week delay till the background check is completed. So a lot of times... A lot the, of times the the deficiencies and the time frames that uh, are um, delayed because of a deficiency is not our time, it's not your time, it's waiting on some, some other function to do what it needs to do to be able to move your application forward. Uh, but about five days if it's perfect, and about 20 days if it uh, has a deficiency in it. So back to workers' comp. So workers' comp, so we do need you to provide proof of compliance with our workers' compensation. So the way to do that is you either submit to us your policy number and the issuing company or you prove um, or proof of self-insurance. Um, if you do not have employees and you are a 50-50 um, corp or a two member LLC or a sole pro or excuse me, if you are a single member LLC without any employees, if you are a 50-50 or two member LLC, without any employees or a sole proprietor, then you could be considered exempt. Um, and there is a section on the application for you to either mark as, yes, you are exempt, or to provide your policy information and the, com the issuing company. So if you have additional questions or you don't think that you should, you need to have workers' compensation, you can contact the Industrial Commission of Arizona. Um, their website is below um, and discuss it further with them. And then not every application, are, you, are we going to look for this additional documentation? But some, some license applications that you submit, you will have to provide additional information or you can provide additional documentation if you already have a license. So an example. Uh, we don't have a separate solar stamp or a separate solar uh, license. Um, some of our uh, classifications include solar, um, but not every company is planning to do solar. Uh, if you are a company, electrical, plumbing, I believe swimming pools may have solar uh, uh, within their scopes. If you are one of those applicants and planning to work in solar, then you must submit a solar warranty. We have an example of what a solar warranty looks like on our website. Uh, you should also know that there are additional statutes that apply to you beyond uh, the statutes that we we have uh, in Title 32 that, that apply to you. Um, then these other three uh, forms are forms that you can submit that 
uh, may be relevant to you. License cancellation. Say you already have a license, you're looking to move to a new license. Um, maybe you were a sole proprietorship, but you're looking to get into a, or get a, open a LLC. Uh, that would probably require you to obtain a new license, and in which case you'd probably want to cancel the old license, thus license cancellation. License inactivation form. Uh, once you are licensed, you are able to actually inactivate your license for two five-year periods. Um, uh, say you're injured, you say you're taking a break from the industry, say the uh, market is not looking great, you're able to actually file an inactivation form, which basically just puts a pause on the license. Licenses issued by this agency uh, last two years after the date of issuance. And uh, so you filing a license inactivation would put a pause on that need to renew. You could cancel whatever bond you have. Um, and within that five years, you come back and reactivate the license. It's as if, uh, as if nothing ever happened. That you'd obviously have to get the new bond uh, secured, but uh, that's the purpose of an inactivation, dissociation, or resignation. Um, this usually applies to the qualifying party. Say you're firing your qualifying party, you're hiring a new one. Um, your qualifying party dies. Uh, you want to. You are the qualifying party, and you want to quit. Uh, the purpose of the notice of dissociation is to get that individual or yourself off of the license. Uh, we will hold you or that individual accountable for any work performed under that license while they're listed on that license. Um, so if you quit and you are not the owner of the company, make sure you get that dissociation in. If you are the owner of the company uh, and you're firing the QP, make sure you get uh, you get the idea. Uh, you want to you want to work as quickly as you can to file that paperwork to remove uh, any individual off that uh, that license that is no longer supposed to be performing the work on the under the license. Okay. Uh, just a quick recap: top five Q QP experience, and we saw a lot of it here uh, in the chat discussion of what are we looking for for experience. If you do have any questions about what we're looking for, feel free to follow up with Maggie or Julie. Um, both of them are, are came from reviewing licenses to rise up into management, so they are perfectly able to answer any questions as to what a license reviewer is looking for. Um, bonds, again, it's just such a technical piece of paper that that's what causes the majority of the issues. Feel free to watch this video again. Call us if you have any questions. Um, ID and background checks, make sure they're done for every individual named on the license, number one. Um, make sure they're valid, uh, meaning the not expired, the ID, and then background checks within the last 90 days, is it? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Uh, and then, then testing, uh, again, that, that deals with either a waiver not being submitted or a test not being taken. All right, real quick, license fees or application fees. Uh, so that first column application fee is a one-time fee. That is a fee that will apply to you because you're applying for a license. After that, after your license is issued, uh, what you'll be looking for is a license fee and recovery of fund assessment every time you renew. So if in our example of, uh, of the commercial or the dual, dual carpentry uh, license, we'd be looking down to the specialty dual, the CR. So 100 plus 30 or 380 plus 370, that license application fee is going to be $850. Um, and again, renewal would be then simply, actually it doesn't account for it here, but uh, upon renewal, the recovery fund assessment drops down to 270. Uh, so it would just be uh, what, 650 uh, upon renewal, um, if I'm doing math correctly, and I don't think I am, I think it's 750. Yeah, 750 uh, on renewal of the uh, carpentry. Um, no, bit 650, I'm a liar, anyway. If you have questions, <laughs> you were right the first time. <laughs> yeah, I was right, and then I did the 370 instead of 270. Um, so if you have questions about the fees, let us know. But I believe the portal automatically generates and tells you exactly what the fees are that you uh, pay. So no need to really cover it too much. Uh, after you submit your license application, what happens? And we talked about it a little bit already. Uh, and five five days is me me hedging my bets against you. Um, it, it's likely going to take a lot less than five days to issue a license if you submit an application that's perfect. Uh, there are plenty of stories where the license application comes in and it goes out on a Tuesday. I'm on a Zoom meeting, so. Um, 
Okay. Uh, um, but again, I don't want to overpromise uh, and have you try to think that you're going to uh, be able to legally contract by the end of the week if you submit on, on a Monday or Tuesday. So what happens? We have 20 days. We have 20 days to inform you whether your license application is deficient or complete. Uh, this is statutory. Um, I almost don't even want to cover this slide, but I want you to know what statute uh, requires of us. So we have 20 days to review it for um, administrative completeness, meaning there are no deficiencies. We have 40 days then after that 20 days to review for, you know, if the experience meets what we require substantively. Um, so in reality, we have 60 days to review an application and get it back to you um, if it was perfect. If it was not perfect, it came in in 2015, we were taking about 90 days to issue licenses on average. Um, so I go over this slide because I want you to hold the, the agency accountable in the future. Uh, it's taking us less than five days to issue licenses. Please keep us honest. Um, there you go. So what to expect now? Uh, again, we will send a survey to the email that you registered with us uh, for this and that survey. Please take the time to fill it out. Um, this is a new venture for us. We've only done about five of these uh, applicant education seminars. Um, Margaret, I think, has attended every single one, and we welcome her back. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, the survey, please take it. Um, the YouTube link to this video itself. We will also include the uh, the slides, any resource sheets that we've talked about, and. Uh, I've, it's a reminder, but it's not really because I haven't told you about it. But what I will ask is whenever you are in the portal, you are identifying which individual is filling out the application. It will ask you if you attended this, this training or watched this training on YouTube. If you have, obviously, you're watching this to this point, please indicate that you have. Uh, we're using the uh, those who attended versus those who have not attended uh, to compare the rates of deficiency so that we can better assist you and future applicants in uh, educating on how to avoid these deficiencies. So again, whenever you're in there saying you're, you're this individual, you're filling out the application, um, it'll ask if you attended or watched the video, just mark yes. Uh, 